Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, John. Thank you, Wendy, for inviting me here. Um, <coughs> I haven't done a share for, I think, over a year now, so, so it's been a while, and I'm glad you actually asked me to share, because I hadn't really, I, although I take a daily personal inventory, I haven't really taken a yearly inventory, <laughs> and, I, and I sort of picked up that, that I had a big character defect that, that came out, I could say, through this year, would, would be people-pleasing. And, um, and now that I think about it and how I dealt with it and being with the AA and how it's helped me out big time, um, I'd, I came to Cedars, it was on the 21st of February 2012. I remember driving up here, it was, um, my life was completely broken. I'd, I was very alcoholic. I was a 24-hour-a-day drinker, which basically means in between sleep, I drank. So it normally would start at 3 o'clock in the morning. Reason being is because it was very quiet and nobody would bother me. The phone wouldn't go and people would just leave me alone. And I could feel, I would watch TV and it was the only time I could feel it, a slight bit of peace. Because by the time 8 o'clock rang, people wanted things, people owed money or... It, the, the fear would grow up in me so, in, to such an extent that um, I was a complete wreck. Um, I'd gone through a, a year of every single day, 24-hour drinking, and it wasn't only my hands that used to shake, my whole body was shaking. I was extremely sick. I think the year before that, I'd gone through a divorce, which was a very ugly divorce. Um, I'd Every single thing that I feared losing, everything came to pass. It was my, my home, my family, my son I hadn't spoken to for a year and a half, my daughter who's sitting here <laughs> supporting me today. We were still friendly, but every time she, she was with me, it was always around alcohol. Everything, my whole life revolved around drinking. And that had been going on for the last 25 years. And, you know, having to have that reality of driving down here with nothing, you know, where you felt you just were hopeless. It was a hopeless situation, and I was thinking, is this my last drink? And, um, and I didn't know. I honestly thought, ah, I might just dry out a bit. I needed, to, I needed help, but I didn't know what to do. I'd never been introduced to the AA program. I didn't really know too much about anything. I tried to give up once drinking, um, I think I was about 27, and, and I used anti-booze and I gave up for six months, but you know, I didn't feel anything improved and I, and I carried on drinking till I was 41. <laughs> that was every single day and it progressed. I was born, I've got a brother, He's two years older than me, lives in Ireland. I was born in Johannesburg. Um, my, my father, who was also alcoholic, um, he was a very, very... I didn't have a, a, a bad upbringing at all. I can't say my, my mother's fantastic. She's still alive. My father was um, a go-getter. He did well, well in business. And, you know, but he was a lovely person, very giving person. There were obviously alcoholic-related problems, but I don't think I was that affected with it, to be honest. Um, we, we moved down to Durban when, when I was about 10 years old, and um, we moved to Westville, and then we moved up to Winston Park. And my drinking started at about my daughter's age now, at about 14. <coughs> I just basically loved it. <laughs> Um, there was always booze around the house. Um, it was ready to be available. My mother didn't even mind that we drank because she was a drinker. My father was a drinker. And it was, it was normal for me to feel that this was normal. And although I wasn't alcoholic then, I could drink on the weekends and get particularly pissed when, when all my friends, you know, they would stop. Uh, but I used to really enjoy it. 
And that just carried on and mine became like a more progressive thing. Um, when, when I finished matric, I almost started a business straight away after that, about six months afterwards. And with the shop, the, we had a shop that was sold appliances and we started drinking every single day. And I was quite active, so I could get away with it. And I, there was never any consequence. I used to drink all day in the bucky, you know, do my work, go out at night, make sure to go home, home at 3 o'clock in the morning and just, just escaped getting caught. My father, unfortunately, he got caught quite a few times and um, he lost his license. And, but for him, he didn't think of it as a problem. He just got a chauffeur. <laughs> and, um, you know, through all that, he didn't think it was odd. And, <clears throat> you know, alcohol has really destroyed his life because he died at the age of 53. So I was still a young kid when he died. And I think it affected me quite badly because I didn't know what to do after that. Because um, he used to enable me, whether it was opening a business or, or helping me with petrol or accommodation and things like that. So, you know, and we, we, we'd become very close, especially when I started drinking a lot because that we, we had in common. Um, we did some lovely trips, Mauritius. We did some rugby trips to Hong Kong Sevens. We did, it was all just alcohol, woman, drinking. And it was just a party at that stage. But it got hold of him. And um, although he died of cancer, but he, his body was ravaged by alcohol. Because he also drank early in the morning and all day. Um, yeah, I'd say through my whole life, I had the shop when I was pretty, pretty young. So I, I, I had all the opportunities for me. I was very lucky like that. Um, we had the shop and then we sold it. When I sold the shop, the new people who took over, that is where I met my, my wife, my ex-wife. <laughs> and, um, and then we started from them. I've got an elder son who's 20 years old. A very lovely child. I've got two beautiful children. Uh, my son's at varsity. He's going to his third year in chemical engineering. And he's, he's just a star. He's a star pupil got eight distinctions in matric and my daughter's doing very well at school I haven't seen a report yet but <laughs> so I've been pretty blessed um, having my own two kids and um, I, you know I'm very grateful for that because through, when I went through a divorce I think it really it really ruined me and it ruined me financially and I went through that year just not really, I was so down and so out and the money was just going. Every single decision I made, um, it was the, the wrong decision. Uh, you know, you'd lose, my, it, it, uh, my life became unmanageable to a point where I just, but I, I think it would happen if, if you're drinking all the time. You, you couldn't really work, I couldn't work because I couldn't hold a screwdriver, I couldn't go to I, cu I couldn't go and meet anybody because of the shakes were so bad. So I used to end up drinking earlier and earlier and earlier, thinking I'm, I'm doing something right. But <laughs> I know now, it, it must have been so transparent that I was a complete wreck. And um, I just went from bad to worse after that. <clears throat> I went to England um, when I was about 28. I think uh, the, the trouble with the marriage had started then. But we'd had my son by then. And I went to England on my own for about nine months. <clears throat> where I started up again. Uh, started from the bottom and started slowly working my way up. And then my family joined me after that. And then my wife left after an argument for about another year. And then she came back to England. And... Um, it was, then afterwards it really went really well. Um, I, I'd worked for a company there for five years. The only company I've ever worked for, for a long period of time. I've always seemed to have had my own business. And 
and it really went well. And that's why there's a six-year age gap between my son and my daughter. And um, <laughs> then we had uh, Jamie in England, and I started the business, which did really well. But I fitted it in with my drinking. There was always the drinking thing. But luckily for me, I think I also got a, a, a strong drive in me to work, <laughs> which, which alcohol took away at the end. But at that particular time, I was a manageable alcoholic. It, it, I could still work, I could still function, I wouldn't pick up a drink in the morning, besides the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And when I got, as soon as I got back from work, I'd be drinking. Um, we'd made quite a bit of money, so at the age of 35, we decided to come back home after a holiday in South Africa, which was, which was pretty awesome because we'd made enough money to buy a house and buy the cars and we thought, no, we'd had a, a good jump in life. So we'd made a bit of money there and all we'd have to really think of in my mind was just I could get money for food, the education, and we'd, we'd have the jump on things and I thought that was a good idea to come back. Of which I think it still is a very good, was a good idea. Although it, when I was 40, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, yeah, and then when trouble started in the marriage, um, and then we eventually got divorced, we had to sell the property, and the drinking really took, took precedence after that. And that whole year was a blur of losing money, losing... I didn't speak to my son for a year and a half. So by the time... It came around. My one friend, Mark, who was in, in treatment, he had just come out and he suggested I go up to, to Cedars. And I had just enough money to go into rehab. <laughs> so I knew I was running out of time because I knew my life was unmanageable at that stage and I, I needed help but I didn't know what to do. So driving down to Cedars, that was, that was the state I was in. And when I got inside, it was, you know, from the brochures, I thought, oh, this is going to be quite nice. <laughs> I don't know if any of you had that experience. <laughs> yeah, I thought, now I can take a chill for a while. I can let the heat die down and think, uh, you know. And, uh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the phone was whisked away. The computer was non-existent. And uh, I didn't enjoy that at all. And, uh, but I... <laughs> After the first week, I sort of accepted. I accepted my where I was in my life, and it started to all. Do, everything started to dawn on me that this actually might be my fault. At that particular time, I was blaming everybody else for everything that had gone gone wrong in my life. It was my ex-wife's fault. It was this business deal. It was that person. Nothing to do with me. And I think. In the end, I was, from being drunk all the time, drunk people repeat themselves. And I think my mother even at the time was like looking at me funny, you know, like, shut up. You know, it's getting boring now. It's the same record playing. And it, it was just going nowhere. And uh, so I got down to the, then they introduced me to the, the Alcoholics Anonymous book. At first, I wasn't too taken in with the people that were trying to teach me because I was very arrogant, I was very self-righteous, but I had no right to be <laughs> because I had nothing. But after reading the, the, the stories especially and seeing, and, and I admitted to myself very quickly that I, I actually knew I was an alcoholic and it, I think even before I got back in, into rehab, there was a lot of me that had just given up anyway. So it, it didn't, I didn't need too much encouragement to, number one, I knew I was an alcoholic, that was a given. But then they told me what, what I didn't really like to hear, is that it's a disease and, and it's, not, it's, it's incurable. So, and then reading the stories and what they were saying, it was all coming together that that's the end of the road for my drinking. And I had to accept that very fast. Because also, life couldn't have just stopped there because I have to carry on with life. Although I'd given up hope, so normally I'd have an A, B, C, D plan 
and, and go like that my whole life. Where if that didn't work, I'd have another plan to, to make that work. At this stage, I had no plan. So I'd, I'd gave, given up and I was ready to listen. I started the, the, the 12 steps. It was quite hard for me in, in rehab, like I'm sure it is for everybody, when you've got a life outside and you've got to try and let it go. You know, I tried not to let it go. There were outside influences. The cars in, in my business were getting crashed. The, the, the girlfriend I had at the time, she'd got cancer. And, and you know, there was a whole lot of reasons why I didn't want to be there. But I stayed there. And, and I got slowly but surely, they, they got me into the program. They got me into praying again. Getting on my hands and knees. And asking and being grateful these are things that I'd never done very successfully in my life. I never liked people much. Um, I used to keep to myself a lot. And, you know, having to come to the, the house and share and open and come to these meetings all the time, it was, it, 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 it was a new experience for me. And I'm sure it is for you as well. It's not, the, it's not something I would ever was used to whatsoever. And I finished the 12 steps. And I left. I, I was still quite sick. You know, a lot of people say, uh, you do your fifth, fourth, fifth step and, you know, you let go of things. I was still very resentful. I was still very, I was still very sick. I was angry. I was disillusioned. But one thing uh, that they said to me, you just keep going to meetings, you keep going to meetings, and I did that. Um, I didn't like the idea of, being a big shot, now I'm living with my mother. You know, it, but then I did it, and it wasn't so bad. You know, I, I knew I had to, financially I was wrecked, so I, I knew I had to do what I had to do in order to, to get going again. You know, there was just no, whatever the dreams in my head were shattered now, and I had to accept all of this. So like drinking for me was something I accepted very early. That, that if I wanted to achieve any of these promises, number one, I've already asked God for His help and He has helped me because since then I've never had the... I've had the urge to have a drink, but it's never been a very big obsession. Now, before that, the obsession was so strong, I could not even walk past the fridge. I had no... Uh, there, was, there was no hold back. There was no hold back to alcohol. I had no control over it whatsoever. And now all of a sudden, since then, and coming out of rehab, it's never got that strong. I think it's because listening to the, the, simple, the simple AA teachings of go to meetings, get a sponsor, you still might be sick, you still might have issues, we all still got them, but if you just keep on doing as I'm telling you to do, you should be okay. And I did that, and I did Bible stu uh, AA um, studies, um, on a Thursday in Kloof and then on a Monday and when I first got out I thought oh, I'll go once or twice a week but as I got into it I started to actually enjoy the AA and the people the people when I first walked into the AA I had, I had nothing in common with them but as I realized as time went on I had everything in common with them you know and the bonds that, that I've had now I've moved to different areas and I've, so I've had quite a few home groups and everywhere I go, I get a very, very good friend. Um, if it's not Geraldine, there's Tony and Belito, there's um, Scott. There, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people that are influential in my life now. But those are the only people I can think of are true friends. You know, the people in the AA that I've formed. And through that, you know, th through coming to, the, to this rehab, and also going through this program and then going out. It's helped me so much, the grounding, to where I am today. Because I had a lot to do once I moved out. I've still got two children I've got to support. They were at school at the time. My daughter's still at school. My son's in varsity. But, um, you know, there it, it, it was a lot of consequence that I, that I was dealing with and that... that that the AA helped me right through each step, one day at a time. 
You know, they didn't say, you can't say, well, what, what am I going to do in the next year? When I first got out, it was, what am I going to do today? I'm going to be sober today. I can make this call. I can look at that person. I can go to that meeting. I can come home, take personal inventory, go to bed, wake up, and start again every day. Now, this worked out really well for me. Because I've, I've got my own business, it, it helps me incredibly in my own business because of this daily routine that has got me, me into, you know, being, being more assertive, being able to go to, being able to see customers, being able to handle problems which used to baffle me, which I used to get my back up. Nowadays I can, I can face a problem, even a hard problem, where I used to get very aggressive, I can, I've learned to shut my mouth and listen, and then turn situations around that before I used to never... You know, I used to just get, in, get myself into a state, I'm right, you wrong, and that was it. Now it's changed completely, but it had to, and I'm very grateful for it. Then I suppose this last year, I was uh, going through a, a year, and then a lot of people, when I was in rehab, they would say, ah, oh, people pleasing, and this, and then you think, well, what is that? They wouldn't explain to you what people pleasing is. And then I thought to myself, so I, f I forgot about it. I didn't have people pleasing. I had it in me, but it never exposed itself because I couldn't people please because as soon as I got out of rehab, I didn't have any money to please anybody besides keep my kids going and the business and, and, and go slowly, slowly. But I think over the last year, it came to, when I was thinking about it now, when Wendy was, was talking about it, was... I, I, I think in rehab, my, my whole thought about sobriety was, number one was finding a, a good relationship, starting again, and being happy. You know, and when I got out of rehab, I didn't have a relationship for about a year, I broke up with a girl, and then afterwards tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. And then I realized... My expectation of myself is very high, but my expectations of other people are also extremely high. And every time somebody didn't meet up to my expectation, there would be problems. So I'd have relationships going on six months, six months, and I'd always find an excuse and end it. And this is what happened. And people pleasing it was a relationship that I had. I think it started in last June. It was a woman, yeah, it, it, and I thought, let me try easier, a, a different this time. But what I was finding myself doing was people pleasing. It came to her birthday, it was a dishwasher's, flat screen TVs, twice, a, two or three times a, a week going out, eating out and being a big shot, because now I'm people pleasing. I'm trying to get acknowledgement from her. I'm trying to make her happy. I'm trying to make the kids happy. My daughter wanted to go to private school. Here we go. But it, this all. And then also, then I had a colleague that was also from Cedars that he worked for me for about two years. And about last year, you know, I, I, started, I started seeing defects in, the, in a character in this woman. She was a, quite a big drinker. And I started getting, getting a bit annoyed because Christmas time rang and we, we went to some party and it was a, like a New Year's party where like everybody was just flat, drunk, pissed. And, and I'm like the only sober person there. And I was like, you know when they're going, it's got three hours to go. It felt like one minute felt like a whole hour. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And then soon after that, I just, I broke it off with this, this girl. And then I turned my, then I, but I wasn't cross with her. I was cross with myself for this for the first time in my life. Before I used to blame people, but now I was actually cross with myself for getting myself into a position where number one, I've, I've used up a lot of money, people pleasing, I've neglected a, a lot of my business, and so I turned my attention to my business. Because it was the end of season, when I should be having a, quite a bit of money, my, my, my work is in air conditioning, so it's seasonal. So sort of, February, you should be 
doing quite well because now you've come through your, your summer and that's just the way it is in, in my industry is that like the end of February, March, you should be doing pretty well. And I found myself not doing that well. But I got very, very hard on myself and I thought it's my, it's my, my own fault what, what happened. You know, I, I people pleased to a point where I where I took my eye off the, my own business, I put somebody else in charge, and, and I ended up looking where I thought, well, geez, I should have a lot more than I've already got. So I think for the next six months, I decided to get another dog, <laughs> and I gave relationships up for about six months completely. And I stayed at home, and I made sure that I sort of punished myself, because I knew that I must take the consequence for whatever goes wrong because I can't keep blaming anybody else because it's actually my own fault. Well anyway, as it's, as it's been at the end of the month, I ended up buying a house. We just moved in at the end of February and it was only from looking at this last year and actually using the AA and actually stop this people pleasing and actually do what I need to do. I mean, my, my child's still at private school and everything, but uh, as far as myself's con concerned, I had to look at myself and be honest with myself and take a, an inventory of where I'm going wrong. Because even though I might be sober, it doesn't mean anything. I have to still, I still have to keep an eye on where I'm going and take a personal inventory. So it doesn't matter how sober you how long you've been sober, it can all change whether you're drinking or sober. But, but I know that, that hadn't it been for the AA and the friends in the AA, you don't get that gut feeling. When I used to drink, I never used to get that gut feeling, especially at the end. And you make the most horrendous decisions, which can definitely change the course of, you know, make things into a bad situation. And that's what I've done. And um, I can be proud to say that, uh, you know, that after four years that it's been an unbelievable road that I've been on. Um, it hasn't always been easy. I still make mistakes. But I've still got the AA always in the good times and in the bad. You know, if I, don't, if I didn't have money to go out jawling and drinking and eating and spoiling people, I used to come home to my family in the AA where it costs you a 10 rand and you could really get to with real people that can really help you that really care for me. And... Um, and I can be just eternally grateful. I think if anything if, that I can take from, the, from being up the, the hill is that at seed has it taught me the grounding to be a better person, to go out and encourage me to go look for meetings, encourage me to get a sponsor, encourage me to do all the right things. And I must say that since I've taken that advice and the advice out of that big, that, the big book, it's helped me tremendously in every single way possible for me to recover and for me to sort my kids out, make sure that they, they've, they're educated, make sure that they're fed, make sure, make, make sure that, we can, that I can build a life from a completely hopeless situation. So I hope you take one of, somebody takes something out of this today and just say, stick at it with the AA because you know millions of people can't be can't be wrong. And you know, this is it's been the, the best experience of my life. Although I've had pretty good life before, before the alcohol completely took everything away, I can see this being a more Instead of having it and then losing it and having it and losing it, this is more sustainable. If I can be sober, I can generally be a happy person. I can generally be honest. I can, I can, I can get up every morning sober. I can be, when I say I'm going to be somewhere, I will be there. If I'm going to pick up my children, am I ever late? Never. Or if I, you become, I'm the parent who goes and picks up the kids at night when they're doing the grom events. Now that would never have happened in the past. And like my daughter will know that I won't be late. Um, my, my customers know, my staff know, the vans, the vans I got, the, the tires are all new, the discs, are, the discs are on date. It might not be easy, but it's definitely made me into a much better 
more reliable person and I've got a relationship with God which, is, which has been awesome um, because although sometimes I take my will away and I want life to be as I want it to be and then it, something happens and, and I get knocked into, into reality but it's a kind of reality which is more important and, it gets, and I end up, I go off, off course and then I come back on and that's the way AA and life has been for me. But without the AA, I would be dead, definitely. And all I want to say is thanks for listening and listening to my story. Thank you.